So uh, the first thing I, I want to talk about is what is AI? Uh, so I'm going to sort of say that, you know, AI is really where we're trying to you know, make machines solve problems commonly associated with human intelligence. In many ways, we would also even think of often AI as being a marketing term right nowadays. Uh, but you know, this is sort of like the big field of what AI is. Uh, and inside of that, we have machine learning. Uh, this is sort of what we focus on you know, most of the time. Um, and this is where you're basically making machines learn from experience instead of sort of explicit programming, et cetera. Inside of that, you have the subfield of neural networks. Uh, and then inside of that, you have this interesting field of deep learning. Uh, and deep learning is, you know, one of the, certainly one of the most interesting parts of what's going on in AI at the moment. So what is deep learning? Well, if you ask the press, the media will generally sort of show you pictures of robots and, you know, uh, things taking over the world. Both of these are real pictures from articles about deep learning. Um, unfortunately, you know, or fortunately, actually, it's nothing like this, right? Unfortunately, they're always getting it wrong in the media. Um, what a lot of people tend to think is that uh, it's about building a brain. Um, this is also, this is a nice analogy, but it's also kind of incorrect too, that really at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're writing code, we're doing some math, we're getting, you know, these, these things to work. So really deep learning is basically a, a subfield of neural networks uh, and, uh, and machine learning. Um, it's just deeper neural networks and it's not even that new. So neural networks have been around for 30 years plus, uh, but it's really only in the last sort of 10 years or so that due to sort of more data and more compute and a few better design patterns, uh, that these things have really started to work and more importantly, started to take off. Uh, you know, generally, also, I would say, anytime you hear someone talking about a, a breakthrough in AI, 99% uh, of the time, deep learning is going to be involved somewhere in that. So, by far, you know, this this sort of you know this sort of thinking about AI is really thinking about deep learning. And there's there's another way we can sort of address this. It's become popular too. So, another way of thinking about it is the idea of sort of software 2.0. Uh, so this is not something we created. This term was sort of created by um, a guy by the name of Andre Kapathy. So uh, Andre uh, is now the head of AI at Tesla. Um, before this, he was at OpenAI. Before that, he was doing his PhD at Stanford uh, and taught some of the courses there around sort of neural networks, et cetera. I, and he sort of coined this term software 2.0. So let me sort of explain what the software 2.0 is and how it's sort of different. So in traditional software, we would have something along the lines of this, where we would basically write a set of rules or heuristics. We would then put our data in, uh, and then we would basically have, you know, whatever we wrote generate some sort of answers out. And this, this has worked really well for lots of things, right? For dealing with databases, for dealing with front ends, for showing graphics, this is a really good system. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for perception tasks and tasks where just the amount of data uh, is, is very different uh, and the amount of rules that we need are, you know, are, are extremely large amount of rules. So this is where software 2.0 comes in. Uh, as machine learning. And this is where we now feed an algorithm uh, a bunch of data, we give it the answers. So we show a bunch of pictures of say cats and we say, okay, these are cats. We show some pictures of dogs, we say these are dogs. And then we let it write the rules itself. So it will then output the rules, which we can then take later on and just pass you know, data through and get answers out. So this is sort of what software 2.0 is. is. Um, it's, it's certainly taking over the world. Uh, if, you know, some famous VCs have talked about you know, software eating the world. In many ways now this software 2.0 is, is driving that. So what can this sort of software 2.0 do? Well, one of the biggest tasks that it's used for is just classification models. So hopefully when you look at this picture, you'll be able to tell quite easily uh, which ones of these are, 
you know, muffins, blueberry muffins, and which ones are chihuahuas. I, uh, this is actually a really easy task for a deep learning model to do. I, so given, you know, given enough sort of examples, it is able then to pick up the differences very easily and actually probably performs better than humans in this. Now, this could be classification on lots of different things. It doesn't even have to be pictures. We can give it, you know, different emails and teach it that, okay, this is what a sales email looks like. This is what a, uh, a marketing email looks like. This is what a support email looks like. And we can train up models to do the classification. This was something that, you know, um, we did some consulting with one of Google's clients about was that they wanted to have an email address that was just hello at companyname.com. And the problem with that was then everybody sent different emails there. So they needed a model that could classify, okay, this email is for this department, this is emails for this department, that kind of thing. So this is sort of a stock standard thing that you know, people are using. Um, we then have things like you know, segmentation models. So this is what's driving uh, a lot of uh, things to do with self-driving cars, that we're seeing things like where we're actually now classifying things at a pixel level. So we can say, okay, not only what is the whole picture or what is the whole document, but what, about, what are individual parts of that? So you see, we can also do what we call object detection in here, where we can basically find objects in them and draw a box around them so that we know what's in the picture, but also where in the picture that is. Um, and another example of this. So this is a, a project that I worked on a couple of years ago. Uh, of doing uh, OCR and ID detection for Thai ID cards. So you can see that this is basically just a picture of someone taking with a mobile phone, and we can have a model that basically extracts out all the details for this, uh, can make a prediction if the person you know, is female or male, uh, can extract their name, and you can see even when you know, this person doesn't actually have a full date of birth, it can sort of work that out. Uh, and, and fill out those details there. So these kind of models, this is using multiple models to do this. And uh, I'm just touching the surface here. There's really a whole bunch of these. We've got things like neural machine translation. Um, I mentioned object detection. Uh, we've got you know, speech recognition, um, Q&A systems. We might get to this, uh, you know, this morning with a, a demo. And then you've got a whole bunch of things like generative models for doing super resolution, um, recommendation systems. In fact, at Google, pretty much every product now uh, is using deep learning in some way, shape, or form. Whether that's you know your recommendations on YouTube, whether that's you know recommendations in something like Google Play, whether that's Smart Reply, where it basically predicts what should be the reply to an email that you got in Gmail. All of these things, uh, not to mention, of course, things like Google Translate are using deep learning. And they're also using it in multiple ways. They're using it on the back end, uh, which Martin will talk about more later on. They're using it on the front end in browsers. They're using it on devices. So obviously Android has a lot of deep learning in it nowadays. Uh, so that this is really something that's taking on. So as a front end or mobile developer, how can you get involved? Well. I don't have a lot of time to talk today, but I'm going to give you a few sort of key things that you should look at. Uh, and we're also going to give you some resources at the end if you're interested to learn more uh, that you can sort of follow up with. The first thing I would say uh, is don't get stuck in sort of just the, the whole sort of theory thing. You really want to focus on building apps, building applications, right? Using, uh, trying to use this stuff in the real world as much as possible. There's already, uh, a lot of people out there who are doing all the research thing, doing the data science thing. I, so the, actually where we're starting to see uh, a great need uh, is that people want programmers or developers who actually understand this stuff, not just people you know, who know how to do uh, data science, but people who, who've got experience of building real world apps, uh, know how to write code in various languages and stuff. So I would say this is one thing you want to focus on. Now, up until you know, uh, up until recently, TensorFlow was really focused just on Python. Originally, at the start, certainly TensorFlow was focused on Python, and you sort of had this whole Python front end. But none of the code is actually being run in Python. 
Um, most people sort of think that, but that's not the case. It actually drops down to a very low level uh, language called XLA, uh, which stands for Accelerated Linear Algebra. And that can run on anything. And the, the beauty of that is that there are actually other front ends for this, right? So there's a JavaScript one, a, a C++ one, a Java one, a Go one. There's a whole bunch of these things. And as TensorFlow sort of grew, so TensorFlow is Google's machine learning framework. Uh, and as this sort of grew, it's become way more than just sort of one framework for Python. Nowadays, it's basically an ecosystem. Uh, and this entire ecosystem really is something uh, that has lots of parts to it. And there are a couple of parts that you should focus in on if you're a front-end developer. Uh, you know, if you're a front-end developer, you probably want to focus on TensorFlow.js, which I'll talk about in a second. If you're a mobile developer, you probably want to focus in on TensorFlow Lite. Because uh, these are ways that we can run this code sort of natively on mobile devices or in the browser or in you know, J JavaScript backends even, things like that. So TensorFlow Lite, like I mentioned, is, is built for sort of mobile apps. I'm not gonna have a lot of time to talk about this today. Um, it basically supports Android, iOS, uh, you know, a lot of different IoT devices, even some things like Raspberry Pis can you know, run TensorFlow Lite. Uh, the one I'm gonna focus on more today is TensorFlow.js. So, uh, TensorFlow.js, there's a lot of people who know how to code in JavaScript. In fact, a lot of people even starting out are learning things in JavaScript. So TensorFlow.js can basically allow you to run machine learning anywhere that JavaScript can run. So this could be a browser, on your desktop, your mobile. In fact, it's got a whole bunch of different things of where it can run this. So you can see, for example, you know, in uh, in in uh, browsers, we can run in pretty much all the uh, you know, different browsers that exist out there. <coughs> Even on mobile, we can do things like uh, React. Um, we can run in <coughs> we can run in WeChat apps. Can run in PWA apps, uh, so that you can actually actually then, if you don't know what a PWA is, you can build something which then installs to someone's phone from the web without having to go through the app store. Uh, we can also run on desktop with Electron, which is a, a nice, very nice JavaScript framework. And then even IoT stuff can run, you know, a lot of the TensorFlow.js on Raspberry Pi or, you know, some of the other things that are out there as well. Um, I'm going to sort of focus in on just a few of these. So I really, uh, let's talk about getting started in the browser. Uh, so if you're a front-end developer, you probably know something like React Native or Angular uh, or, or maybe Vue or something like that. Um, all of those frameworks are able to take advantage of, of TensorFlow.js and use it. And there's lots of things that you can do with this. You could do you know, something like uh, object recognition where you could just build an app uh, so that you could come along and sort of detect uh, you know, different objects. And there are a bunch of sort of pre-made ones out there that you could use uh, if you wanna try these out. Um, you can do things like uh, face meshes. So if you wanted to build something like your own Snapchat filters, where it can track a face and stuff, uh, you can see that there are models out there that you can use for this already uh, that are really small and yet are able to sort of track whole elements of people's faces. They're being used in real world projects too. So you can sort of see, uh, here's an app made by L'Oreal that was you know, doing this uh, as well. Um, you can track actual people. So we can track, you can see here, we can sort of track the parts of people's bodies, what movement they're doing, uh, a whole bunch of different things. So if you've got an idea for a game or something where, you know, someone had to dance and you, you needed to sort of grade their dancing, uh, you would be able to use something like this. And I'm really just sort of touching the surface here. So uh, this can be, you know, sort of anything you really want to dream up with. This could be uh, augmented reality apps, gesture-based, you know, recognition, um, sentiment else. You can do things with text, uh, with JavaScript as well. It doesn't just have to be images. I, and a whole bunch of different things like this. So what I thought is let's jump in uh, and I'll show you uh, just a quick demo uh, to sort of talk about this. Right? So if you want to open this demo up, you can play along with it. You know, if you've got it, uh, if you've got your laptop next to you or something like that, uh, feel free to learn. And this is just a very rough demo that I put together just so we can sort of look at this. 
Uh, okay, so here is a, a, an app. So this is running in React. Uh, and it's just a very simple app. And what we're using here is a TensorFlow model uh, to basically listen in uh, to these commands. So if I wanted to control the browser with a, a set of commands, I can just basically bring something like this along and just go up, down, one, left, right, seven, six. Okay, let me just press it again. Six, five, four, three, stop. So this is sort of an, a, you know, an example of building one of these apps. Uh, so it's, it's able then to listen to my commands uh, and run that. So it takes the audio in, in JavaScript, uh, converts that uh, to uh, something that the model can read. Uh, and then the model basically has to predict what the actual thing that I'm saying is. So this is literally, you know, sort of like, a, you know, a two hour application, if that, right? Uh, if you know something like React reasonably well, you can probably put it together in, in under an hour uh, and get this working. So one of the things I wanted to sort of stress here is that don't get stuck thinking that, oh, okay, this stuff is really hard uh, and I have to sort of go to university to learn it or something like that. Um, Yes, there are elements of doing the research and stuff like that can, that can be very difficult. But nowadays, more and more of this is becoming accessible to mainstream developers. You're going to see at Google I.O. this year, a lot of announcements around uh, Google, you know, bringing out things to make it more accessible even still. But already we're able to sort of, you know, take something like this, use some off the shelf models or train our own model uh, and then be able to put it into production to use something. Um, let's look at another demo. So uh, I got this just this morning. So what I did was I came to this website, probably people know the website Guardian, and I've just copied out a bunch of this article. And uh, so you can see that this, this, this is the article in here. Let me just sort of scroll up if you can see that. I, and then I can sort of ask, uh, you know, ask questions about this. And the model is going to take my question and then take the passage and find the answer in here. So if I if I ask something like, uh, "How old was Prince Philip?" Okay, and I run that. You see, sure enough, it can read through and it can get out. And I'm, I'm showing multiple answers here in case it didn't get the right one, but you can certainly see that, okay, it's gotten even on the first one, it's gotten that he's 99 years old. Okay, if I ask something like, uh, who was he married to? Right. Again, okay, it gets it right, the queen. Um, if I ask how long were they married? Uh, I think that was the one I tried out before. Were they married? Now you'll see, obviously, all of this data has to be in there. So more than 73 years. So, okay, yes, we can see this, you know, but you'll notice that uh, this data that mentions 73 years, it's not like saying it the exact same way that I said it. It's not just doing a sort of search. It's doing an intelligent sort of question and answer of going through this and looking for the different, you know, uh, things ab about here. So if the facts are in here, I can then use this model to basically extract the facts out. So I can have the whole, you know, whole article in there uh, and then just ask questions out. Now this is running totally in the browser. This is not going to a, a cloud system. It's not going to any sort of fancy things. This is basically just JavaScript that's running in my front end uh, in React here. So just to show you those, those sort of a, a few quick demos. Um, to get, let's have a quick look at the code for sort of doing this. You can see that uh, if, you, if you do know JavaScript, you'll realize that this is very simple code of just bringing in a model, uh, bringing in a model uh, that you can sort of see that, okay, we've got something like this model that we bring in. Um, we can then just run a very small amount of uh, code to basically load the, that model, uh, in this case, we brought in an image as well. Uh, make you know, get get that image, make a prediction on it, 
and then it will deliver it. So my point being that there's not a lot of code in here for the deep learning element, right? A lot of this is nicely abstracted so you can get on with building your application or trying out to do some of this stuff. Um, the, there are a whole bunch of different APIs. If you did want to train a model in, in the browser, you can do that. Uh, so more and more, you know, this TensorFlow.js is, is if you want to go to the next level and do some things that are more sophisticated, you certainly can. Uh, and like I said, you know, this could be running on, you know, on React, could be running on React Native on a mobile phone, et cetera. Um, the key thing is that, you know, don't delay, right? There's definitely, a, you know, there are definitely jobs out there for people who can do this stuff now. I, it's definitely something that is becoming sort of easier each day. Uh, but there are still just a bunch of people who, are, you know, a bunch of developers who are sort of scared at taking the leap of starting to do this. So if you are interested in getting into AI and you, you, know, you want to sort of start from somewhere, you don't know where to start, et cetera, uh, go and check out TensorFlow.js. Go and look at you know, some of the things that I've, I've put on here today. Um, if you're interested to sort of find out more, we would, you know, uh, come and we've put up a, a form today uh, to sort of put your name and email in there and we will uh, happily tell you, you know, more about courses and stuff. Uh, Martin and I run a meetup together uh, and we'll, you know, we'll talk about, you know, when we're doing sort of events for that. Um, we're doing some beginner events for that in the next two months. So if you are interested in getting started for this, uh, make sure you check it out. Because uh, really, there's, you know, I can understand sort of five years ago, this was very difficult to get into. Even maybe two years ago was still quite difficult to get into. Nowadays, we're at that sweet spot where if you're a developer or you're beginning to get you know, reasonably decent at being a developer, you can sort of pick up this whole new skill set, which then allows you to build applications that are uh, far beyond what other people have got out there. So with that, I'm going to finish up and uh, Martin's going to take over uh, and show you a whole bunch of things about uh, the back end sort of thing and maybe talk about some other interesting things as well. Martin, are you there? I am here. Great. Um, so I, I'm Martin. I, I'm partnered with, with Sam on Red Dragon AI. Um, and I'm going to talk more about the back end side. So Sam's talk focused on essentially front end developers. And the models he showed were all running in the front end on the browser itself, um, which is kind of exciting because it also means you don't have any latency to the back end. Um, there's, you know, there's an immediacy to this. And also, you don't have to pay for a GPU in the cloud. On the other hand, there's a lot to, to be said for being a back-end developer. Um, and you know, back-end developers also make the whole web work. And I'm going to talk about how someone who's coming from the back-end can think about machine learning and, and you know, what kind of impact it might have. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm also a Google developer expert for machine learning. Um, basically, this means that um, Google has selected both me and, and Sam as being kind of um, knowledgeable about machine learning. And you know, we run a meetup for, you know, with Google, um, but also we're unpaid by Google. So it's, you know, kind of a, um, you know, it is, it's not just a, a glory thing, uh, or maybe it is just a glory thing, okay. Um, we co-organized the Singapore Deep Learning Meetup. Um, I have a background in kind of finance, where I basically after my PhD, I, I spent a long time in finance. But then after the financial crisis, I came to Singapore and started doing the uh, machine learning thing in earnest again. Um, during this time, we've been publishing deep learning research. We have Red Dragon AI and we teach these courses as part of that. So quick outline of what I'm going to talk about is like, where are the jobs um, and some kind of practical AI basic ideas so you can actually see you know, where we're coming from in terms of the ideas, um, both in images and in text. One of the things I'm going to emphasize is the pace of change. And so while it's kind of important to get, you know, your head around some of these ideas now, um, you've also got to kind of keep, keep a bit fresh because there's a lot going on and it's only going to get harder to get into this if you don't, if you don't do it now. Um, so we do run courses. We'll also have a link um, Sam has put up a link, but if you if you go to the link, you, you can sign up to kind of get more information. And in particular, these courses 
because of the IMDA funding, they're kind of a no-brainer to do if you're a Singaporean or a, a PR. Okay, so from the jobs point of view, um, I think the, the Infocom, this is Gov Tech kind of thing, has put out a whole um, lay of the land of lots of different kind of careers in tech. They have a very complicated um, kind of flow diagram for the different levels of people and the different roles. Um, this is not really how I think of it, but they do seem to include a lot of the roles and they have done a good job here. Um, some of the roles, which I would say for, for, for a non-developer could be um, like an analyst where they're you know, like a data analyst. They're trying to increase the value of what they're doing, going beyond spreadsheets or SQLs or just visualizing data, um, trying to get some domain expertise from you know, where they're working. This is kind of what an analyst can do with machine learning. Um, but as a developer, you can probably do more than this. Okay? For a manager, on the other hand, and we've talked to, we, we give a course for project managers, um, and that's focused on essentially like case studies and how to think about machine learning research or machine learning products, because machine learning jobs are kind of different from plain engineering jobs. So if you have like a waterfall a software development thing, you've got deadlines and bug reports and, and that kind of thing. Very different feel for machine learning where it's much more exploratory. Um, it, it may be that these are unknown questions that you're trying to tackle, um, but of course you still need to deliver. So you also need to figure out what can be delivered uh, and how to think about that. So we do have, um, do have courses which are kind of applicable to the manager uh, thing, but I'm really focused on developers here. So from a developer side, um, if you've got a background in research, there's obvious value in kind of creating models, doing research to figure out the right models, um, reading papers, coming up with stuff. Um, but really the industry usage is very different from what you'd find in academic um, pure data sets. And so once you get to industry, e even as a researcher, you're going to be dealing with kind of real world stuff. And the real world is much messier than a pure data set. Things change. There are lots of different requirements coming from different places. It's a different field to research in general. But in terms of being a developer, um, you know, can, can you get into it? Do you need a PhD to do this stuff? And our answer is, is definitely no, you don't need a PhD. Um, you can pick up like, practical AI skill sets. It's very, very doable. And a lot, in, in fact, a lot of the, our first course, we explain, well, here is the mathematics of the situation, but the frameworks, which are freely available, have all of this kind of baked in. So while it's helpful to kind of understand where the mathematics is coming from, you can also use the frameworks and it's all fully implemented for you. Even the, the GPU um, hardware stuff is kind of, or hardware related optimizations have been done for you to a certain extent. So there's a whole bunch which the frameworks are solving. And this is kind of the big win for um, open source and you know, the availability of data sets and all this kind of thing. So really there's no need to be reinventing this wheel. And much of AI in industry is much more like an applied science. On the other hand, there's a bit of art involved in as much as there's no hard and fast rules about what's going to work and what, you know, what techniques are going to work in some sense. So here is where you kind of use different models, see how they perform in the real world. And that's a, that's a much more useful skill to have than developing the, the super ultra new um, researchy kind of role, research kind of model. So, the other thing is to understand how these machine learning systems are rather different from just cloud servers. Um, a normal cloud server, you, you put, you throw up a VM, um, you can, you know, there's various techniques you'd use for, for scaling, all this kind of thing. It's rather different when you come to these machine learning models, just because you may have requirements on, maybe you need GPUs, uh, maybe your the data that you need to store in memory is actually kind of large. Maybe the latency on these things is large. Um, these models may not, or these frameworks not, may not be ultra reliable. So things might be going down. Um, 
The models may need versioning. So not just the code need versioning, but there may be different versions of the model which need testing and comparing to each other um, because they may react in different ways to, to users. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of different cloud side things and understanding, even if it's not the cloud, just understanding the scaling issues, essentially ML ops, which is a huge part of machine learning in industry, um, which isn't the researching the super new models, but it requires good understanding of how machine learning interacts with all of the other stuff which you're probably quite familiar with. Um, but it is different. I mean, so this is one of the flags which we hold up for the project managers. You've got to think about the ML ops as different from just regular DevOps. Similarly, if you're on the mobile side, and, and Sam you know, talks a, a bit about this, um, you also got to worry about, can we make the model smaller? Um, can we make it lower latency? What do we think about privacy? Um, all of these factors are things which can go into the, how do we build this system, um, which is not the, you need a PhD to do this kind of thing, but it's, uh, I'm a developer, I can make myself an expert at this, and essentially create demand because there are very few people who can actually get experience at doing this. And once you've done one project, now you've got some experience. It's, uh, it's early days. So let me just talk through some of the kind of the practical AI basics. And, and Sam talked through um, some of these and gave some examples. Um, one of the things which kind of spurred the entire deep learning revolution back in 2012 was the ImageNet competition. And the, the competition involved essentially trying to classify a thousand different classes of things in images, amongst which were like many breeds of dog, but also aeroplane, lamp, kimono, tusker, tusker's a kind of elephant, and there's a whole bunch of different things in ImageNet thing, and the training set is millions of accurately labeled images, and the goal is you have to try and make something which will predict, you know, tuskers in, you know, in images which it's never seen before, or lamps, or whatever. And so you kind of measure for this to win it. You need to have a good top five accuracy or ideally good top one accuracy, meaning that the, 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 um, your prediction comes out in the top five, within your top five predictions, the correct answer is there. Or for the top one, your prediction is the correct answer. Now, this is pretty tough. And it used, before 2012, it used to be something which was um, extremely tough for open CV, essentially old style um, image processing methods to do. Um, whereas in after 2012, this deep learning thing has meant that these things are now performing way better than um, humans do. So since 2012, the idea or the, the basic philosophy for winning the ImageNet competition, you build a deep learning network. Um, you can vary some of the building blocks that go within it. You vary how they're connected together. You use farms of GPUs or create TPU devices. So Google itself has created hardware to do um, matrix multiplies or tensor operations. This is a tensor processing unit um, so that they can do these things. So clearly Google knows that this deep learning um, is, or that they knew back maybe 2016 that this is gonna be such a huge impact that they will have you know, full server rooms, full of things which just do this deep learning thing. And this is now spreading out across the industry. So the achievements from this is these models are now better than humans at the ImageNet task. On the other hand, we can't say that they understand images. That's a kind of a real um, intelligence thing, but they're very good at knowing what an image will have an instinctive relationship between here's an image and here's the class it should be. But the interesting thing is that while winning this competition may seem like a kind of a, a peculiar thing, um, the key point is you can use something which is trained for ImageNet to use on other images. So training a full ImageNet model is very expensive. Um, lots and lots of you know, PhD students have done this or, or graduates whatever have done this and trained it on huge clusters of stuff but the trained models are free. They don't cost you any money and they have, are free in the sense that they're like Apache licensed. So they're usable commercially um, without paying anyone anything. Um, I would tend to love the fact that it's free as in freedom. Um, I think this is a good thing for the world, um, but your boss may think that being free as in dollars is, is probably more significant. 
So the key idea here is that the ImageNet models have learned to see. Uh, it's not just that they're good at classifying, you know, what's a lamp and what's a tusker, um, but it can, they, they generally learned what, what makes for an object worth looking at. So what you can do is on unknown classes, um, you can actually see, well, what mistakes do these make? these models make. So suppose like a pile of rope may not be an ImageNet class. I'm not, I'm not sure, but suppose we have piles of rope are not in ImageNet, but it may be that it would consistently think they're like either snakes or maybe, which would be an ImageNet class, or maybe they could be some kind of sea animal, which would also be an ImageNet class. But if I have a thing which is a consistently snakes or sea animals or pearls, um, or wire, then I can probably say, well, this is rope. And if I'm saying, well, is it rope or is it ship? It's pretty, it's gonna be pretty clear from the mistakes the ImageNet model makes, um, which one of these two is. So basically we're saying that we can use, uh, we can train a kind of a small model on top of a pre-trained ImageNet one to make it so it can solve our task using our images and our classes. And this is a technique called transfer learning. It's one of the key things which means that all this uh, fancy research which people are doing and publishing and giving away can be leveraged at any company. And so these models will appear not only on, on, on GitHub or whatever, um, but also onto your phone. So people have spent time making these models smaller. And these are the things which can be leveraged on your phone, but you would need a thin layer of model on top to make it useful for your task. So there's a quick example I can give, and I'm just gonna pop through this. This is an example from what we used to give as a jumpstart course. And we're now calling this course Foundations because we think it's probably more, more accurately about what the foundations, what, what this is in respect of deep learning. It's a nice laid product project, has a nice local flavor. But what I would say is that for the foundations course, everyone gets to choose their own project. So we kind of insist that people have something which is of their own um, imagination. And you know, I guess we have some backup projects if, for people who don't have imagination, but really we want to encourage people to kind of imagine new things, create new things. And, and in particular, when you're looking for a job, having your own project for your own, um, for, you know, for something which you actually care about, it speaks loud and clear to an interviewer um, that, oh yes, this person really did the project rather than they were the person who also turned up to the um, capstone project meetings rather than, oh, this was the, the key person on the capstone meeting project. So let me just have a quick glance through. I, in the interest of time, I'm gonna, this is gonna be super quick. Um, this is a, a chicken rice classifier. So what this person found is that uh, there was an Instagram account um, which, public, which consistently looked at chicken rice photos every day. And so they wrote something to scrape the Instagram account along with maybe the hashtags on it. And they could see, and this is, I'm showing you a Jupyter notebook setup essentially, which is something which Google also gives everyone a free GPU. So if you're worried about not having GPU resources, the Google Colab is free. And it's a Jupyter notebook like environment, which is, as long as you've got some kind of Google account, they will give you for free and they will give you a, um, is this kind of time limited, but you can kind of keep renewing it. They, they don't mind this. So it can either be a K80, which is like an older GPU, or a P100, which is pretty pretty up to date, or a V100, which is pretty cool. It's a multi-thousand dollar GPU you can get for free. Anyway, so here, here they're doing some kind of ingestion and pre-processing. Um, you can see some kind of here are images of what these things look like. So it's either gonna be um, steamed or roasted. That's the classification task they want to do. And so there's a whole bunch of different, um, so now we've got a folder with roasted stuff, a folder with steamed stuff in it. And then they load up a, a, mo a NASNet mobile model, which is a mobile, a model we can talk about you know, in the course. Basically it's pre-trained on ImageNet, but on top of that, what we're gonna do is let me just skip past this one. We're gonna replace the last layers with a fully connected network. So here what we do, da, 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 here we're gonna take the output 
of the base model. And then we're going to add new stuff on the end, which is what we're going to train. And so here, um, I mean, this just demonstrates the size of these models, but the vast majority of it was the pre-trained model. So then we can go through and just train the model on the data. And very quickly, you can see that the accuracy has gone up from, I guess, initially it was near 50-50, but the accuracy goes up and up into like the 85 kind of area. And I think this was fairly limited data. So this is kind of a proof that these ImageNet models can be, um, with transfer learning, you can get to good models on, and this is just an arbitrary image picked off the internet of apparently steam rice. So this is a, a nice project. And this is the kind of thing that people can do after they've done the foundations course. Um, let me just go back to the presentation. Okay. All right. So let me just briefly talk a little bit about more image stuff. Um, here we've got the other kind of thing you might be interested in, self-driving cars. Now, this is a sexy topic for deep learners, um, but also maybe you want to track objects or maybe you want to detect where different things are in images, track them, count them. It, maybe you want to generate images or colorize old photos or fix up bad makeup or, or, or something or do facial recognition. Another thing which is coming across um, popular in China, um, I think is coming uh, to, to uh, an MRT near you soon. But there's lots more stuff that can be done with this computer vision stuff. And we, in our advanced computer vision course, we also cover these other things. We do some object detection in foundations as well. So on the text side, I'm going to be as quick as I can to get through to questions if we have them. And if you have questions, please put them into, I, I, I guess there's a box or a slider or something. Um, for instance, the text kind of tasks you might do is, is this product review a good or bad review, right? Or is it spamish or offensive? These are things that you might want to have in your current e-commerce system if you don't already. Um, you also might want to classify like, what does this customer want? If I've got some emails coming in, um, maybe I want to send it to the right place. Um, is it an emergency email or is it just spam? Okay. Um, or it may be that you're analyzing news articles and you wanna find out, okay, who is being mentioned in these news articles? Is my brand in these news articles, for instance, which may be a simple, um, a simple text match at the moment, but you can imagine how um, your brand could be mentioned in lots of different ways. And you may want to just surface stuff which is about your brand, not necessarily um, specific. I mean, maybe there are people associated with your brand um, which you also want to match, um, which the machines can learn. And maybe you also then want to say, well, suppose um, someone appears in uh, in a news article, maybe it's a, a Trump, um, it would be helpful to know which Trump you're talking about um, because, you know, these Trumps are significantly different. So this is where you'd want to have some kind of back end, which is now trying to assess how these people connected, how much proof have I got that this is in fact, you know, Jennifer Trump, who has nothing to do with the Trump family. Okay. Um, here's a quick example for feedback urgency. Suppose we have a stream of feedback coming in, um, we'd want to say, well, some's positive, some's negative, some's urgent. Um, what do we want to do with classification task? So this is um, where we'd say, well, can we use other models like ImageNet before? And the key thing is that now, since 2018 or so, models like BERT um, have come along, which have people like Hovingcase have kind of They've taken other people's weights and just product made it into like an API or a, a GitHub repo, which has made, made the models much more accessible. Um, these things are much, much, much better at understanding uh, text, just like ImageNet is quite good at understanding images. So this is this dramatic. These things are dramatically better since, say, 2018. And people who are still using what well, old school methods would be TF-IDF or LDA, th th there's kind of old school, or people then pepped it up with embeddings for word embeddings, word to vec would be an example of that. But now we're in a new world, um, in a kind of post 2018-19 new world of transformers. Um, this is dramatically better. Um, I don't think I've really got time to explain how these things are trained, but if we're interested in transformers, 
we have a course for that. So in the foundations, we touch on this. We, we introduce how what, what Bird is like. Um, but we also have a um, our advanced text course is spends more, which spends two of the three days talking about transformers. And we believe that you know no one else is doing this. So it's not just no one else in Singapore is doing this. We think we're we're um, we're giving pretty cutting edge um, talks about these things. So and and people are, we're happy for people to do projects involving all this stuff. So here, what we do for the feedback urgency thing is we take a pre-trained BERT model, still use our annotated data, but but the number of examples we're doing is much smaller than it ever used to be. We train a new head for the model. And then we deploy the combined model, it's like some API. So this is where um, the MLOps thing comes in because the BERT model is a pretty, pretty large model. We might be talking hundreds or hundreds of megabytes of parameters. And so this is, um, these things are not so easy to set up. It doesn't, it's not like I can set up a machine and it'll be online within 200 milliseconds. Even with, if I dockerize everything and do it nicely, Getting this model warmed up takes some time, but also there's latency involved in getting uh, answers back. So we also need to account for updated data. There's a whole bunch of other things to do for real world production ready models. Okay, so the pace of change is, um, things are moving very fast. New models give us new capabilities. Getting the latest stuff into production needs people with many different skills. So the task is kind of never finished, um, but it does scale. And so this is why people are pouring money into this. Um, you need people to make it scale, um, but that's a good thing to do. If, that's a good situation to be in if you're a person with skills. So I can't talk about our courses very much just in the interest of time. Uh, we do have a series of five courses um, for different aspects, but we start with this foundations course. We've done it in conjunction with SG Innovate over the past few years. Um, we're currently waiting for the next IMDA funding cycle because we've updated some of the courses. Um, this makes it so that, you know, if you're a student, it's up to 100% funded. If you're at an SME, it's, you know, the vast bulk of this is funded. Or if you're older than 40, this is, it's almost a no-brainer to do these courses with the funding from IMDA. So here's a link if you're interested. Um, basically, I think this asks for your email just so we can, so you don't have to keep checking back at the SG Innovate site. Um, but we, we won't spam you. Um, but we do want to make sure that you know people who are interested in the courses get to go. Um, so uh, I kind of mentioned this before. I know we need to move over to the questions. Um, our foundations course is three days, kind of face to face, which is these days online. Um, there's video content. You get to play with real models and do challenges as we go along, but also you get to pick a project. This enables you to build a portfolio, you get a certificate. Um, people, we have a whole history of doing this with um, essentially classes of like 25, 30 people. Um, and we've got good stories about you know, people who've got jobs and, and stuff on based upon what they've learned and what this adds to their own resume. Uh, what we want people to have is already have done some programming. Uh, the Python thing, if you haven't done it before, it's not a super difficult language. But the main thing is being willing to learn. Um, there's a lot of new, new stuff uh, to learn during this course. But it's more about the thinking thing than about the, the, the nitty gritty of the code. But we do both. We, we, we really focus on the code as a way in rather than the mathematics. Okay. Here's a quick slide on the advanced courses. We've got computer vision, text, a more researchy course for number four. And then the number five is really an MLOps kind of course. Um, and for this, the, the number is, you don't have to do these in order, um, basically, but most of these will rely on the foundations course, which is why we've named it that way. Okay, in conclusion, being developer is already a key skill for um, getting into machine learning. Deep learning knowledge is, is key for the future. Um, there are many things you need to do for getting these models into production, engineering, data, strategy even. Um, the word on the street is kind of MLOps is better paid than many of these other roles just because there are few people with these skills. Um, in some sense, there are lots of PhDs who can do research and they want to do it. So they're gonna get paid less than the MLOps who actually get it done. 
Okay, so there's some Q and A available via chat. Um, here are some. There are emails address, email addresses for us. Um, but if you want to learn more, um, go to this Bitly link. So Bitly learn minus more minus AI or dash more. Okay. Dash AI. And and Martin, uh, if you can hear me, we also need to add a, a, a two to the AI. Uh, oh really? They share my slides, or you know, or, or share yours, but just add a two there. So apparently the, the link wasn't working uh, at the start. Oh, I'm so but sorry. I've, I've answered people. No, no, it's okay. I've answered people in the uh, in the chat already. Um, but hopefully, yeah, if, if people want to find out more, uh, go to learn. You know, to Bitly learn hyphen more hyphen AI two. There we go. Yeah. Um, exactly like that. Yes. <laughs> uh, or, yeah, or on Martin's one also. Um, okay, I, so we've got some questions. Uh, let's go through some, some really interesting questions. So one of the things that people are asking Martin is all about languages. Uh, what coding and programming skills do we recommend that you know, people should learn with if they've never done coding before? Uh, so I, I think we'd say start with something simple, right? You know, go, go for, you know, Python is definitely an easy language to, to run. Uh, and then also, I, uh, you know, JavaScript, I, uh, it would be BB1 as well. Right. So, so JavaScript is really nice to experiment because you can do it in your own browser just using the console. So in some sense, you've already got the Java language running in front of you if you're watching this online. On the other hand, if you're trying to get into Python, I'm sure there are, there are good courses out there. Um, but if you want an environment where you can just start dabbling in Python, going to Colab is actually quite a good way because immediately you get a Python environment ready to just type stuff into. And so um, this, you know, we, we like Colab because it's all set up for machine learning particularly, but it can also be used just for seeing what Python will do. Um, so, so those are the, the JavaScript and Python, are probably the two key languages we suggest now. Um, for, for particularly for our domain. So the, the next question, I think we've only got time for one more question apparently. Um, uh, okay, so uh, the next question is that with the state of the art is growing insanely rapidly uh, in literature. We would totally agree with this. Um, in fact, the link that you put for the person who asked that question is a year old. So it's not just from two weeks ago. Um, uh, the, the, how do businesses solve the building on sand feeling? Um, you wanna have a go at this and then I'll have a go at it? Okay, so I guess the building on sand feeling is it only really exists if the old models were suddenly went wrong for some reason. So if you build a model based upon a, a, an internet, sorry, an, an image net, um, pre trained image net network, and then there's a new state of the art, uh, we'd be in, in some ways, many ways, we'd probably say if a model's a year old or two years old, if your, if your results are still good, it's not as if you've built on sand. You've, you've got a good model already. Now, suppose it may be you're super worried about a competitor using the very latest stuff. Um, that might be true in text because there has been a sea change. On the other hand, if you've got a model which works well and you understand it, that's actually also a powerful tool because understanding even a bad model, but you know it's ins and outs, that can be, that's a value. Um, so, and, and also these old models don't kind of, it's not like code where it, it deprecates and it will never work again. Um, the old models still work. Um, it's just that there may be some incremental improvements. Yeah, I think I would add to that, just focus on building products that, you know, that, that more than building actual sort of ML solutions. Uh, if it works as an ML product, and you'll find that for, for, for state-of-the-art stuff that is coming out, uh, for most things like classification stuff, it's only, you know, very incrementally better than the previous one. Uh, so you don't need to, you know, worry about like updating every few weeks kind of thing. Uh, you know, that, that's certainly something we cover a lot in the production course about applying things to production and stuff. I think we're out of time. I, I've been told on chat that we're out of, uh, out of time. But listen, we, we're going to be doing some public uh, sort of stuff. Uh, everything's still online. Um, we're going to be doing some sort of, you know, beginner evenings and stuff coming up soon. Uh, for free, that's just for the meetup and stuff like that. So if you do go to uh, the URL that we put up, uh, the Learn More AI 2, um, we'll send out information about the meetup and stuff like that there so that you can uh, join it and come along. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Martin and Sam, for your sharing. I'm not sure about what our audience thinks, but I love the steamed or roasted chicken rice application <laughs> that Dr. Martin quickly brought us through. AI and chicken rice, you know, who knew? So if you have any questions for our presenters, do check them up in the speaker set. So that's at the top, at the speaker set. I'm sure they love to take all of the questions. So next up, we have our, sec our next workshop, which is covering a very, very hot topic. It's called Exploring Opportunities of Blockchain and Creating Your Own Cryptocurrency. Happening in the next few minutes. I'll see you there.